Good afternoon, everyone. I believe we're live now. Uh, now, the first thing to say is you were might have been expecting Bridie Rice to be moderating this session, but uh, unfortunately for Bridie, she's had some sort of catastrophic uh, computer meltdown. Anyway, we're trying to sort this out. So I have just uh, jumped in uh, to get us underway. Hopefully, Bridie can join us before too long. Uh, but if not, I'll just uh, keep carrying on because she's very organised and has got some excellent notes for me to follow. Now, first of all, just right at the top here, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the tra traditional owners uh, on the land from which I'm joining you, uh, Ngunnawal country here in Canberra, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I extend those respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us uh, here today. Now, just a few uh, pieces of housekeeping before we get into our discussion. Uh, we do want this session to be interactive. Uh, we're not together in person, but we are interested in hearing from you. Uh, we, we do uh, want to get uh, to a point where we can um, have our panel engage with the audience. So uh, post your questions via the question and answer uh, box. If you would like to ask the question yourself, uh, also raise the hand icon. Now, we've been having a few technical issues in uh, promoting people up to get them to be on camera and to have their uh, microphone enabled. And if we do, I'll just um, uh, read your question out for you. And then if you prefer not to come on camera to ask your question, just type not live or can you please read this for me in front of your question and that will uh, help us to know that um, uh, you are not going to appear on camera and we'll ask the question for you. Now, for those of you who uh, are Twitter uh, fiends and might like to post about the forum, the hashtag is at ACL Forum. Now, uh, we have a terrific panel with us today and I'd like to welcome them and to have you join me in welcoming them. So first of all, uh, very pleased to have uh, an, an old colleague and a friend, as it happens, from Department of Foreign Affairs days, uh, Mr. Dave Sharma, join us. Dave, of course, is now a Member of Parliament. He's the member of uh, Wentworth, a uh, very old and famous uh, seat, of course, uh, for the Liberal Party of Australia. And before that, Dave was a senior member of uh, Australia's diplomatic corps uh, and served overseas, uh, including as ambassador to Israel. Uh, really glad to have a fellow Canberran uh, joining me here today. That's uh, Daryl Carp AM. Daryl's the director of the Museum of Australian Democracy, um, a really great little institution. If you haven't come across it before, I really encourage you to have a look at the museum's website and have a look at some of the uh, work they do. Uh, and then lastly, uh, delighted that Larry Diamond can join us uh, all the way from the United States. Larry's a senior fellow uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford uh, University. Uh, Larry uh, is one of the world's foremost experts on democracy and liberalism, uh, prolific author and commentator, uh, and has been some, writing some terrific stuff recently about uh, the state of democracy worldwide and the state of democracy uh, in his um, own country, of course. So our topic today is liberal democracy and uh, how we gauge its health at the moment and what we can do about uh, going about renewing it. And um, this is a subject near and dear to my own heart because we know that uh, liberal democracies the world over are under challenge at the moment, both from external forces and from internal forces, nationalism, populism, political polarization, identity polit politics are all issues that challenge uh, liberalism uh, and institutions in democracy. Uh, they make governing harder, they make getting things done harder, they make good policy harder, and sometimes they erode trust in our democracies. And then overlaid on top of that, of course, we have a very significant new dynamic, which is the competition, very fierce, tough competition now between uh, China and the United States and between China and some other democracies. And we're not, we're not in a two block world at the moment, but we are seeing, I think, a hardening separation or a line, if you like, between the world's autocracies and the world's democracies. And the new US President Joe Biden sees this as one of the defining 
contests of the age. And his mantra is that democracies have to prove they can work uh, in this new contest. So with that uh, quick introduction, uh, welcome again to our three speakers. And um, Larry, if I could begin with you, um, you've talked about uh, a prolonged global democratic recession. And I just wanted uh, you to talk through, talk uh, our audience through that idea and what you mean by it. Uh, well, thank you, Richard, and it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all. I wish I could be with you in Canberra, but uh, this is the next best option. Uh, I have very fond memories of previous visits to ANU. Um, what it means is that there uh, are more countries moving away from freedom and democracy than to it, and this is a trend that is now about 15 years old. Uh, it's as long as the earlier 15-year trend of uh, democratic expansion following the end of the, the Cold War. And the inflection point was around 2006. We can show that statistically. Um, levels of freedom, as Freedom House has been documenting, have been kind of gradually descending since about 2006 or seven. But for most of that period, it was a, it was a modest trend. And what uh, I think should be deeply worrisome to us uh, are the following bullet points I'll put on the table um, to frame some of our discussion. Number one, the trend away from freedom and democracy has been considerably accelerating in the last five years. And the last five years are the first five-year period since the third wave of global democratization began in 1974, when significantly more countries uh, left democracy, then moved to democracy. And now we're living through a breakdown of democracy in slow motion in the only Arab democracy in the world, Tunisia. I realize that's a long distance from you and from us, but strategically and symbolically, it's very important. Secondly, uh, as you noted, um, the advanced industrial democracies have really been experiencing a lot of challenges to their quality and stability. Um, the erosion of trust uh, and satisfaction with democracy in Australia, which Gerald may speak to, notwithstanding, I think Australia has not suffered nearly the, um, uh, the level of challenge and crisis that we're facing now in the United States where we have one of the two great political parties, a substantial portion of whom, of whose members uh, in our parliament, our Congress have, I'd say, abandoned democratic principles. And, you know, whose uh, last president, Donald Trump, was contemptuous of democratic principles. So that's the second trend. You've got challenges to democracy and liberalism and tolerance and fidelity to constitutional norms within what we thought was the core of liberal democracy. And then the third challenge, Richard, is what you referred to, that um, we have the rise of new, uh, of new competitors to democracy, and particularly China, which is uh, A, rising rapidly in power, and I think posing an existential challenge to the future of democracy in Taiwan, and B, is increasingly asserting itself uh, as a systemic rival to democracy in the world. Thanks, uh, Larry. I, I want to ask you one quick follow-up question and then uh, come to the rest of the panel. Um, but, you know, do, do you think then that the period in which democracy was uh, spreading globally, in which more countries were becoming democracies, do you think that's an ahistorical period that is out of the norm and we're returning to something that's more like a longer term trend or do you think that we can uh, the, the trend against democracy can be turned around well i think the first statement is true and the second one is very much uh, not inevitable that is a lot of long-term changes in the world begin as ahistorical developments right the Industrial Revolution was an ahistorical development and so on, but it doesn't mean they can't be enduringly transformative. So I think what was naive, uh, Richard, was to assume 
that the expansion of freedom and democracy that began in the mid 70s and then spread to Asia in the 80s and then brought down communism in Central and Eastern Europe and so on, it was naive to assume that was just going to go on without interruption indefinitely, that it was never going to face challenges and reversals. But I think it's by no means inevitable that uh, it's going to slip back uh, to say a, a, a pre-1985 reality. Uh, I think we can resume democratic progress in the world, but it's gonna require repairing and rejuvenating our problems of democracy, certainly in Europe and the United States. I'll let you all comment on Australia. It's gonna require a very robust collective response to both the normative and security and technological challenges uh, that China is posing to freedom in the world. Uh, and it's probably going to require some innovation in the forms of democracy. We might, uh, hopefully we'll have some time to come back to that question, that point about innovation in democracy. So I think it's an interesting one to dig into. But um, Dave, I want to bring you into the conversation here. Now you sit now uh, at the centre of um, Australian democracy, but you also, as I said in the introduction, uh, had a long and um, very successful career as an Australian diplomat. I'm interested in your thoughts on this idea that we, we seem to be entering uh, into a period of what some people call a competition of systems, that is a divide between autocracies and democracies, and increasingly democracies are going to work more closely together, uh, do more things together. And this might not be a rerun of the Cold War, but it's certainly a marked uh, difference to uh, previous decades. I mean, how, what, what's your own view on that? Do you think that's inevitable? How strongly do you think it's going to shape the world and uh, Australian foreign policy? I think we are certainly heading for a you know, we're already in a period of heightened strategic competition and tension around the world. To my mind, though, it's got much less of an ideological character than the Cold War did. And it's much more a, you know, traditional great power character where countries have different different interests and, and a different view of the world order. And there's clash. And you're right to say that I think democracies are cooperating more closely, but it's not so much necessarily because they're democracies. It's more because they share a view about the importance and the value of the underpinning of the current global order, the liberal world order, the, the rules-based order, the international institutions, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the UN and its, um, and its forums for dispute settling, free and open trade and global markets. That's all those underpinnings of the liberal world order are things that democracies are very attached to, including Australia. But we also see countries that um, you know, may not qualify strongly as democracies. Uh, they might be one party states with elections that aren't particularly free or fair, um, but they also share those views and, and, that, uh, uh, and they're part of that broader camp, if you like. So um, I think there's something to this, but I wouldn't want to overstate that we're into a, a period where there are two competing world models here looking for ideological dominance. I think it's much more traditional um, great power-based competition that's underway. All right, and a quick supplementary question for you. How, how then should Australia approach this? The Prime Minister on his way to the G7 meeting recently gave a speech in Perth where he, he said uh, that uh, Australia's objective was a world order that favours freedom. And on the face of it, that would seem to buy quite heavily into the idea of a competition of systems. Look, I, I think it. Uh, I think it does, but I, I'd say when he was using that term, he means sort of freedom in the in the global sense, the free movement of goods, people, capital, ideas, navigation on the high seas, you know, commerce, all these things that have underpinned the current world order, without necessarily having a um, a strong view about how states should govern themselves or organise themselves internally. I think we're, you know, we're well past that high water mark that was really hit during the. Bush administration in the United States of um, seeking to export a model of governance to other countries. It could be our preferred model. We can always be encouraging of those countries, but I think certainly the experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also in the Middle East and the wash up of them, the Arab Spring shows us that um, 
trying to change a country's system of governance or its own internal political order is an immensely difficult task and can really only ever emerge in a sustainable way through an organic fashion, a, a ground up fashion. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Dave. Now, Daryl, um, as I said, your, uh, you and your uh, institution spend a lot of time looking at the uh, health of Australian democracy. Uh, and I'm just interested in your perspectives on where you think Australia, Australia's democracy sits. Is it uh, being subjected to the same kinds of pressures that we see in other Western democracies? Uh, clearly, you know, we're not America, nor perhaps even the UK. But you know, where, where is Australia? How healthy is our own democracy? Well, um, I, I like to sort of frame it in a, in a museum con context, which is this magnificent photograph that we have in one of our exhibitions, which is this flat um, uh, farmland, horizon goes on forever, uh, and there in the middle of it is um, a, a bridge table, a kelpie, and a little sign that says polling place, and a farmer is voting. And he's standing out there, he's the only person to be seen for miles around, and this is in the middle of, you know, God knows where uh, in Australia. And I think that gets to the heart of some of the real strengths that Australia's system has, which is not to say that it's perfect. It's not like all of the democracies around the world. You know, there are, there are um, stresses that are coming at it, but we do have a world-class democracy. We were the first, um, you know, constitution that was written by the people and voted on by the people. We gave... Um, we were the first to embrace universal, universal suffrage for, I will say, white men and women in 1902. Um, we're one of the only a handful of democracies that have had peaceful transition uh, since federation between governments. And um, we have really critically important an independent electoral commission which sets our electoral boundaries, which checks the voting systems. And so we have a number of processes in place that allow us to, to actually manage it and an independent high court. So all of these are, are extraordinarily uh, critically important um, components of how our democracy works. What I would say though, is as a museum, we talk to tens of thousands of visitors every single year. I mean, this is an unusual year because of COVID, but nonetheless, we have 90,000 students that come through and we survey every single one of them as they go through on what they think about democracy and where they see it all going. The good news is that young people are incredibly pro, young Australians are incredibly pro-democracy as a mechanism and a methodology for the future. Um, but probably the single biggest comment we get through a series of interactive experiences that we have is that people feel that they are not being heard, that their voice doesn't count. Um, and that is reinforced by some of the research that the ANU's, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called, the ANU's Electoral Commission or Electoral Study does, where they talk about, you know, how much people trust um, politicians and how much people trust the system and the the data that the data from 2019 is that only 25 percent of people believe that government can be trusted and 75 percent believe that people in government look after themselves now we we don't see that in quite the same way you know we have a lovely little uh, series of um of interactors become a political pundit tell us what you think um, and, and we ask them, what should we expect from politicians? How would you improve Australia's democracy? And the critical comment all the way through is they want to be heard more. They want people to act uh, not just in terms of their uh, themselves um, and their own sort of political advancement, but really to take into account the people that they represent and to act for the whole of the country as opposed to just themselves or their party. That is the main comment that we get coming through. And if we have some time, I can read some of them because they're, they're terrific. Some of the, the thought and the intelligence that goes through them, you know, um, honesty and a will to, to vote in a bipartisan way is really important. You know, those are the sorts of comments that people are making. So, so I think, you know, in answer to your question, I think we're doing substantially better, but I would add two dot points to Larry's. 
and those are in terms of the key challenges. I think there is that media shift, the, the really extraordinary shifts we're seeing in terms of technology, social media, um, and um, the way artificial intelligence is, is selecting what people get to see. And as I said in, in, in a little bit earlier, that narrative of being unheard, those are two additional points I'd add to it. Well, thanks very much, Daryl, because you've actually touched on uh, an issue that's engaged a couple of our audience members. Uh, so Glenn Barnes, Glenn, uh, glad you couldn't join us, uh, has a question or a comment really about the point you raised about lack of credibility or loss of credibility and trust. Uh, another um, audience member also talks about um, polling showing uh, antipathy towards democracy or lack of confidence in it. And Glenn asks, what are the best ways of re-engaging the community and rebuilding faith in the system? And Daryl, you gave one, a couple of good examples on the way. If you have another one or two, I'd be interested in hearing them. And then I might ask Dave also to comment on ways of re-engaging the community and rebuilding trust and faith. Uh, and then, Larry, after that, I'll, I'll come to you because I've got a question about America's democracy as well. So thanks for that question. Um, look, I would say two things. The first is um, obviously civics education and understanding the system and, and knowing uh, the power that you have as, as a citizen, as a voter. I think what I would say as a museum at MOAD, at the Museum of Australian Democracy, is for us... Um, the narrative of democracy is much bigger than just turning up to vote. Uh, it is an active, you know, for, for, for us, we define it as active, informed civic engagement. And that can cover an, a whole spectrum of, exper of experiences, whether you're standing for parliament, whether you're working for parties, being part of the system, working for the public service, handing out how to vote cards. Or sim but for me, the big one is to be an informed voter, to actually think through what you're standing, what you're standing up for, um, to to be a, a a critical media user, but it, it is about an active, informed engagement. And the best thing we can do is to educate our citizens about, you know, how one goes about doing that. Okay, Dave, do you want to jump and, in? Curious, sorry, uh, Richard. And the curious thing is that that teachers are quite uncomfortable teaching civics. That's probably one of the big pieces of research that we've discovered in doing some of the research that we've been doing over the past 12 months due to people not coming to us. How can we support teachers? Civics and, civics and democracy is something that they find quite difficult to teach. So that's the second part of it. It's teaching the students and ensuring we've got the resources for the teachers. Dave? Yeah, look, there's two, two things I'd, I'd say. I think I think Darren makes some very good points, Richard. One is, in my experience at least, I mean, politicians are, are always desperate for people's views and perspectives. This is the currency by which we live. You're always engaging the proverbial taxi driver to see how they think things are going. Um, if someone stops you in the streets to raise an issue with you, you take that as a data point. And it's, I always find it remarkable how non-empirical we are really as a profession. People will all gather in Canberra and their data set will be, you know, the neighbour they spoke to, the kid's birthday party they're out at the weekend and what the taxi driver said on the way to the airport. So we're all desperate for this, I think, as a, as a class. And um, often I find that, uh, and if, if you're, as a politician, a retail politician, as we all are, if you're asked to something, you'll turn up. If a group of 10 people say, hey, we want to talk to you about this, you'll jump at that chance because this is a great way for you to connect with voters. So, I think politicians, in my view, are very keen to listen and, all, and to hear anyway. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be complications in whatever policy is being offered. But the disconnect seems to be where people don't know how to, how to bridge that divide, you know. Um, you know, how do they get their voice heard? And it's, it's quite simple. I mean, you send an email, you ask a politician to a, to a meeting, um, you turn up to a community forum they're having, you dial into the Zoom that they're doing. Um, but I think there is some, something there because generally speaking, I think our system is very willing to listen. As I said, it doesn't always mean that agreement is wholehearted and nor should it be and nor would we expect it to be. Um, but politicians, and this is a non-partisan point, all the ones I deal with, they're always desperate to hear more views and desperate to be as close to their community as they can be and understand what makes them tick, which means they want people 
you know, getting in touch with them and putting their issues on the table. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Now, for those of you who might have come into the session just a little bit of late and were expecting uh, the wonderful Bridie Rice to be moderating this session, Bridie rather sadly had a catastrophic computer failure uh, shortly before uh, being due to come online. And she put a lot of effort into preparing this session, engaging the panelists, and now I'm rampaging and tramping my way through that carefully uh, <laughs> planned session. <laughs> for which apologies, Bridie, but we'll get there. Um, Larry, I want to come to you. Um, you know, many Australians looking at uh, the last few years of American democracy, uh, I think would have been thoroughly alarmed, even those of us like myself who have great faith in the power of American renewal, in the power for, you know, America to reinvent itself and to recover. Uh, really deeply worried about the state of American democracy. So can, uh, as Joe Biden says, can US democracy prove that can it work? Can it, can it fix itself, uh, overcome this incredibly deep political polarization we see uh, between, um, uh, within American society? Well, um, uh, Richard, I share the, share the sense of alarm, but I also have many currents of hope. And uh, let me explain both parts of that. Um, I think the defection from basic democratic norms on the part of a significant swath of um, our political class has been shocking, first of all. Second of all, um, we have been drifting into deeper and deeper <clears throat> political polarization and political correctness and ideological litmus tests on both the left and the right. If you read uh, Ann Applebaum's um, brilliant new essay in The Atlantic called The New Puritans, you'll see what we're dealing with on college campuses and in, in other realms, maybe not Daryl's museum, but other museums in the United States um, in terms of basically, you know, intolerance and closure of debate and, and, and just difficulty in hearing one another, not just in politicians hearing their constituents, but people listening to one another. Uh, and uh, the polarization is without precedent in the last at least 130 years in American democracy. So political scientist, I, I feel on solid ground in making that argument. Uh, and there are many drivers that we know about. We're in a much more competitive period in American electoral politics when two political parties are much more finely balanced in their competition. It contributes to polarization, but social media and cable television without mentioning any challenges, uh, any channels or personalities um, are certainly contributing to this. On the other hand, I think we have entered an immensely uh, fertile and creative period uh, in American democracy that um, is similar in some ways to the progressive era in the early 20th century that resulted in women getting the right to vote and us getting the referendum uh, and the voter initiative in a number of states and led to uh, many uh, good governance institutions being established at the national and state levels. And I'll simply mention that the number of uh, democracy defense reform and renewal organizations, mm -hmm. uh, both of politically experienced individuals former civil servants, scholars, and so on, as well as grassroots activists is mushrooming. Tremendous uh, philanthropic resources are going into supporting them. The campaign to get various versions of your preferential vote in Australia, which you may yawn about, but which we, many of us envy um, because we think it could give uh, voters new options other than you know uh, a republican to the far right and a democrat perhaps to the far left uh, that is uh, gathering steam and i'll just close by saying because i think it's relevant uh, to the question 
you raised previously about how to rebuild faith in the system and the point that Daryl made about people being unheard, we've got new tools and technologies that we're developing to facilitate and call forth uh, active informed civic engagement. Uh, and one that I'm involved with that I, I think is, is exhibiting a lot of promise uh, is the deliberative poll or the tool of deliberative democracy. Mm -hmm. We gathered 523 Americans together in Dallas, Texas in 2019 to deliberate on some of the most divisive, divisive issues in American politics. We gave them balanced briefing papers, uh, access to uh, experts with different points of view and immerse them in small uh, groups of 10 to 12 people with radically different views. And we achieved uh, dramatic shifts in opinion on some issues, but more importantly, dramatic shifts in polarization. Now that was 523 people. I think we can scale that up through media to make that a national conversation. But I'll just close by saying we can also scale that up in utilization uh, by bringing it as we are do doing to the schools and to young people and to community organizations around the country. We have actually developed an online platform for deliberation, not unlike what we're using right now, that could enable ultimately tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to deliberate in this way. And I think it carries, it's just one example of innovation uh, in order to generate more active informed civic engagement. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I did read that Anne Applebaum essay. Uh, I try to read everything that Anne writes because she's brilliant and it was rather frightening, I have to say. And of course we see a little bit of that here in Australia, no doubt about it, not quite as bad, I don't think. We actually have um, questions flooding in, uh, which is great to see. So I'm just going to pick a couple of questions. Uh, here's one, I think, for both Daryl and Dave, perhaps in that order. It's something that we actually discussed briefly in our pre-forum get-together. So the question from James Kell is, a federal corruption commission is understandably awkward to create, but isn't it important for democracy's credibility? So. Daryl and perhaps then Dave? Look, it's certainly, from, from a museum perspective, it's certainly something that is continually put forward um, in terms of some of the ways, you know, how might you improve Australian democracy? You know, it's up there with fixed terms um, and, and um, a bunch of other similar sort of difficult concepts to manage. Um, but... You know, I think that the strength of Australia's democracy is that it does evolve and change over time. And certainly some of the work that we're currently doing, we're, we're actually doing some research into an audit of Australia's democracy and having a look at some of those sorts of things. But I would be much more interested to hear from Dave in terms of the challenges that something like that uh, would present for, for the government. I think... Um... I guess I've been slow to be convinced of the need for this. I'm, I'm sort of probably... a conservative in the sense that I don't like to change institutions unnecessarily. I'm always cautious about upsetting um, the balance of power within a system because often you can create a new institution with a view to fixing something and you have an unintended consequence. But I think um, the case has been made for something uh, like this. And I think there's certainly, as Daryl indicates, pretty wide public support. I guess what I just want to ensure that happens with this is a lot of this will be the the, the, the the important stuff will be in the detail and what level of power does this body have? And I guess I just want to make sure that the separation of powers sort of remains intact and that the areas where the parliament is meant to be sovereign and where elected representatives who are the ones who are accountable to the public take decisions are still able to take those decisions rather than that decision-making being supplanted by a body of, of experts that decides they would have reached a different conclusion. Um, that's where we need to make sure that I think the lines are quite clearly drawn. And I think, you know, we have all these bodies nearly universally, I think at a state government level in Australia. And I think in some states they've worked um, well and in others they've, they've been issues. So I think we've got a pretty diverse body of practice that we can draw on now when we're 
when we're designing this to make sure it does what it's intended to do, which is, you know, police misconduct, but also restore public faith or help improve public faith in the political system without encroaching upon things that should rightly be the decision making of elected representatives. I think that's the challenge here with the design of this body itself. Okay, thanks, Dave. Now, I'm going to stay with you if you don't mind. Uh, I've got a very interesting question here from Andrew Podger. Uh, the question is, Daryl rightly highlighted the role of institutions such as the High Court and the Electoral Commission. She might also have mentioned other institutions such as the Public Service, uh, the Australian National Audit Office and so on. So question for Dave Sharma, where is the conservative voice emphasising the role of such institutions in the administration of government services. It's here with me, Andrew. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, look, I think that's a very good point. Um, I am a, you know, an institutionalist. Um, I've spent my career in the public service. I'm a big believer in um, the separation of powers. Um, I, I'm very uncomfortable when people attack independent institutions, be it the you know, the police, the public service, the Australian National Orders Office, the High Court. Uh, I think we've all got a role to play in making sure we've got a healthy system of government and a healthy democracy. I think in Australia, um, and Darrell rightly pointed this out, this is one of our great strengths. Because we've got trusted institutions, we still have an agreed basis of truth. So we don't have after an election people accusing the AEC of stuffing ballot boxes or using voting machines that came from... Venezuela that changed a whole swathe of votes. But even through this pandemic, I mean, we don't have people saying, well, the numbers are wrong or um, just because you said there are so many positive cases, where did that come from? I've heard a different set of numbers. We still have a, an agreed version of truth here in Australia, I think, from which our political debate proceeds. And a large part of that is because of the, the strength and the credibility of our institutions. So uh, I agree with the premise of the question, that is it's a very important part of our political system. And I think sometimes you can overlook these things that play a less prominent public role, but have an equally important ballast function in your system. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Daryl, I just wondered if you had any observations on that question. And then, Larry, I'll come back to you. Um, my observation is actually more in relation to Dave's response regarding um, an agreed um, set of facts, which is absolutely critical. And there's a body of research that was done by the Rand Institute in the USA, which coined a phrase, truth decay, which is one that I, which speaks very much to me as somebody who comes from previous life and media background. And what they were talking about, these key trends that we're starting to see, which is increased disagreement about, you know, facts and data, uh, the blurring of the lines between opinion and fact, the increasing relative noise of opinion over fact, and um, de declining trust in previously trusted institutions and um, sources of information. And all of those together, I think, are creating some of the problems that we're starting to see in Australia. And that certainly has happened, you know, in, in the USA, because it's leading to, you know, uncertainty, paralysis, alienation. Um, and, and the big one for me, which is where, again, the museum keeps on coming into it, is this erosion of civil discourse. Because if we can't sit down, and have a conversation around different points of view and find some way through, and certainly deliberative democracy is one really powerful way to do so, um, we actually have a problem with this system moving forward because we're unwilling to hear opposing points of view at the moment. Thanks, Daryl. And yeah, and as Larry said, you just see this so forcibly, of course, in America, as he and many others, including, I think, Anne Applebaum, <laughs> have said, if you can't agree on a set of basic facts, how, how can you actually have a conversation about something? If yeah. you can't agree on what the basic truth is in a matter, how can you then go about developing policy and winning support for it? Larry, I don't know whether you had any further thoughts on that question, uh, but the, the other question I wanted to ask you was, again, um, we talked, uh, or I think I sent you an email about this in the run-up to the panel, but I was struck by a piece in the New York Times after... Um, the last US election by Tim Wu, and that he, he, he argued the premise of his piece was that actually America's formal checks and balances, Congress and to some extent the courts, weren't all that effective in checking Trump's autocratic instincts and in certainly, and in certainly 
not in uh, eventually saving the election outcome, if you like, and that what really saved the Republic was a set of informal uh, limits, and he named three, the separation uh, between the president and federal criminal prosecution process, the traditional political neutrality of the military, uh, and the person, personal integrity of state election officials, some of whom, of course, were Republicans and who stood up in the face of immense pressure. So how, how, you know, how important are those informal uh, types of protections for democracy in America and how much under threat are they? Uh, they're under serious uh, uh, threat. Um, let me uh, just say... Uh, in response to Daryl's last point, uh, a, a kind of a word of warning. I, I, I would, um, I'm cheered by the fact that things aren't nearly as bad in Australia as they are in the United States, not to mention in Poland or Hungary, but um, pay close attention uh, to what's happening in the US because in terms of the media and the truth decay and the alienation and the polarization, you know, our present could be your future uh, mm -hmm. if you don't act proactively. And it's not that we can't ameliorate it. We're certainly not gonna eliminate it, but I think we can contain it and improve it. But the more this gathers momentum, the harder it is to do and you get into this uh, this absurd stuff of the traction that QAnon uh, conspiracy theorizing is gaining now and the destructiveness, the dangerous destructiveness of, you know, denialism about vaccines, for example, we've got a really shocking proportion of the American public, mainly on the right, but also on the left, uh, who just believe incredibly stupid and factually baseless things about these vaccines. I don't entirely agree with Tim Wu on the first point. I think that it actually was the American judiciary more, uh, more than the other uh, things he mentions, or as much I, is probably a better way of putting it, as the other things he mentioned that saved um, our uh, election uh, uh, process in um, 2020, because even very Republican judges uh, found uh, the uh, Trump lawsuits completely baseless and refused to give them uh, any credibility. I think uh, Trump and his campaign challenged the election outcome at the state and local level in more than 50 judicial proceedings and lost all but one of them and failed to lose only on a technicality in the other one. And some of these, as in Pennsylvania, were uh, uh, Trump-appointed judges who ruled against him. So um, will the courts hold next time? I think part of the problem we're facing, uh, I'm sorry to keep further alarming people in Australia uh, is that we're dealing with um, a set of militant anti-democratic actors who are learning from their failures and going after um, all of these quote informal institutions. And of course the neutrality of our system of electoral administration is not an informal institution, it's a formal institution. But it's a formal institution with many trap doors. And I repeat again, um, and I've worried for a long time, by the way, before I had reason to worry, but just as a result of my study of other democracies around the world, about the vulnerability of the United States system of electoral administration as a result of the fact that we do not have a national independent electoral commission, or if you accept the logic of the more radical American federalism that we have compared to your federalism, we don't even have 50 state independent electoral commissions, which would be a big improvement on what we have now. Uh, we have as the chief electoral officer at the state level, a partisan elected official, the secretary of state. And we just kind of lucked out in Georgia 
that a very conservative Republican, Brad Raffensperger, wouldn't do the building, the bidding of people who wanted to undemocratically erase the outcome of a democratic election. What the radical Republicans are doing now is running candidates for secretary of state in some of these states like Michigan and against Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, who uh, deliberately intend to politicize this process. And one of the problems is that you know, if you get electoral administration making these decisions the next time around, the courts may be more reluctant to reverse them. And I'll just tell you one final nightmare scenario, which some of you may be aware of and others are not, and that goes into the very big basket of the misfortune of the United States being the first democracy, and therefore are having so many antiquated constitutional provisions that we've never uh, bothered to uh, or succeeded in removing. Uh, any state legislature could, uh, by constitutional uh, prerogative, decide um, not to award automatically the state's electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote in the state. They could pass a law saying that the popular vote for president in Arizona, in Georgia, will be advisory and will make a final decision on who gets the electoral votes in the state. Wow. And that would be, of course, radically undemocratic, uh, but constitutionally very likely permissible. So um, that is the ultimate informal norm, as Levitsky and Ziblatt write in their book, How Democracies Die. So much of democracy is about um, forbearance, not utilizing all of the power that you potentially could. It requires more forbearance in the United States because our, our institutions are older, less modern, less visionary, uh, you know, less nationwide. And so the, we've been more dependent on the norms and now the norms are breaking down and we haven't revised the institutions. All right, well, we are definitely at wrap up time. So I might go, uh, Larry, Dave, and Daryl, give you the very last word. Just a minute of any additional thoughts you might have on what we should be doing to leave us with um, some more hope uh, today. Well, uh, one hope uh, on the geopolitical front is the Quad. Uh, I know this is not a conversation on security, but if we don't meet the challenge in security terms posed by China, uh, we can't achieve anything else that we're, we're talking about now. It's going to loom larger and larger over time. So I'm encouraged that this is moving forward and that partnership and Australia's role in it, I consider crucial. And I will repeat, uh, and not only with respect to the US, it sounds like in Australia, I've got to look up uh, Glenn's organization. I took a note of it. Uh, and uh, here in the US, there are all sorts of democracy reform organizations that are really uh, working now at a grassroots level for change with some very intriguing uh, ideas for um, reform of our electoral system, reform of our districting, reform of campaign finance, uh, maybe even we'll eventually get reform of our, um, uh, of our system of electoral administration. I think we're entering a period in the US where the stakes are gonna be much larger, but the civic engagement is going to be uh, much more vigorous and uh, broad-based probably than it has been at least since the American Civil Rights Movement. All right, excellent. Thanks, Larry. Dave? Um, look, just two observational points, and I think they've, they've come up through this conversation. One is that, you know, the, the strength of any political system is only, only as good as its constituent parts, and that, you know, in a, citizen, in a citizen's democracy like what we've got, that depends upon the active engagement of citizens. I think too often in Australia, um, and perhaps it's self-serving of me to say this, but people sort of outsource the dysfunction and the problems to the political class and say it's all their fault, there's nothing I can do about it. Those guys are all crooks and liars and charlatans. Well, 
you know, we're only as good as the people that put us there. We're only as good as the parties that people join. We're only as good as the civil society we engage with. So if, you, if you're unsatisfied with the system of government you've got, you know, get involved because ultimately we all own it collectively. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well said, Dave. Daryl, you get the last word on this big topic. My last word is democracy is not innate. It's not in our, you know, immediate instincts to act for the common good. So practice it. You know, be aware of it as picking up on what Dave said, immerse yourself in it and practice it because it's not something that comes naturally to us all. All right. Well, on that um, positive and hopeful note, uh, I will call it quits. I want to uh, sincerely thank all three panellists uh, for being so generous with your time uh, and insight. We really ask a lot of our panellists, not just to be with you today, uh, but uh, to do the pre-forum organisation, to get their heads around big subjects like this. And um, it's been a really rich and fascinating discussion. I've really enjoyed it, despite being parachuted in at the last minute to manage it. Um, I hope uh, our audience got something out of it. There is, in my mind, no more important uh, issue right now for Australia and for um, our uh, alliance, close alliance partner and friend, America. And so um, with that note, thank you all again and um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>